Nietzsche said, we require at some time new values. Nihilism stands at the door. Whence comes this uncanniest of all guests? Point of departure. It is an error to consider social distress or physiological degeneration or corruption of all things as the cause of nihilism. Now, that's a typical Nietzschean phrase. Because there are three profound ideas in that sentence, and each one is in a different phrase. So, Nietzsche said at one point, I can write in a sentence what other people write in a book. And then he said, well, what other people can't even write in a book. And this sentence is a good example of that. So what does he say? Well, you know, if you see that people are suffering and in trouble, one thing you can say that is that the reason for that is that the economic system is unjust and they're layered along the bottom, and that's the fundamental cause of their suffering. But Nietzsche doesn't allow that to be an interpretation, a causal interpretation, because he says, there are multiple ways of interpreting your position. And mere absence of material luxury does not necessarily destine you to one perspective or another. Physiological degeneration. Well, people are unhappy or suffering because they're ill in some manner. Well, you could make that a matter of definition by saying that if you're suffering or unhappy, you are ill. But that's not a causal argument. It's just a different way of categorizing the data. And Nietzsche would reject that because he would also note that there's some correlation between physiological health and meaning in life, but the correlation, is, the correlation doesn't imply causality, and, and even if it did, the relationship is by no means perfect to the degree that you would want a relationship to be before you accepted it as relevant. Or corruption of all things. Well, that would be the idea that being itself is evil, like an evil trick, which is what Tolstoy said, by the way, when he wrote his confessions. Because Tolstoy, at the height of his intellectual power, he was the most famous novelist in the world, and unbelievably well regarded well throughout the world, but particularly in Russia. And he was a very, like a socially benevolent man, and well regarded for his wisdom. For years he was afraid to go outside with a rope or a gun, because he thought he would either hang or shoot himself. And the reason for that was that he had been struck by the idea that life is so unbearable that it should be eradicated. And he couldn't think his way out of that. And it was a, it was a, 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 it was a, a form of thought that was actually very characteristic of intellectuals in Russia during his time and in, during his time and in his place. I mean, Dostoevsky wrote about exactly the same sorts of things. But it, even Tolstoy noted that merely observing that the world was a corrupt and evil place was not necessarily enough to tilt people towards nihilism because there seemed to be people who weren't nihilistic despite the fact that that seemed self-evident to him and he thought Tolstoy actually turned to the Russian people you know, he, he, he was very entranced by the idea of the folk and folk wisdom and he turned to the Russian people as a source of new inspiration, like the peasantry. And Tol Tolstoy actually fought for the freedom of the peasantry. And he felt that their simple faith, so to speak, was, was something truly admirable, rather than something pathetically pathetic and weak from an intellectual perspective. He strove to emulate that, that criticismless faith. But of course, he couldn't do it, because once you've taken a bite out of the apple, there's no going back, so to speak. Nietzsche says, distress, whether psychic, physical, or intellectual, need not at all produce nihilism. That is, the radical rejection of value, meaning, and desirability. Such distress always permits a variety of interpretations. Rather, it is one particular interpretation, the Christian moral one, that nihilism is rooted. The end of Christianity, at the hands of its own morality, which cannot be replaced, which turns against the Christian God. The sense of truthfulness, highly developed by Christianity, is nauseated by the falseness and mendaciousness of all Christian interpretations of the world and of history. It's a rebound from God is the truth to the equally fanatical faith, all is false, an act of Buddhism. Skepticism regarding morality is what is decisive. The end of the moral interpretation of the world, which no longer has any sanction after it has tried to escape into some beyond, leads to nihilism. All lacks meaning. Well, that's rooted in Nietzsche's criticism of Christianity, because he believed that Christianity was exceptionally morally flawed, because all it offered its followers was the possibility of salvation and 
and redemption from their suffering after they were dead so it was projected into some other world which, as far as Nietzsche was concerned alleviated people of their local responsibility to try to improve things here and now and Jung's comments about that were essentially that it was the proto-scientists recognition of the fact that the spiritual salvation that Christianity promised was no longer sufficient that motivated the development of science so for the, for the, for the early Christians, this is part of the tension between Christianity and, and science for the early Christians the idea was that the earth in some sense was ineradicably corrupt and that all you could hope for in your earthly life was suffering and that you should, you should accept your suffering and hope for salvation in the future after you're dead well, obviously that philosophy see, appeared insufficient for people and Jung's hypothesis about the development of science was that a counter fantasy developed in the unconscious of the Europeans which was that the material realm which had been defined as evil and therefore not worthy of any study or any pursuit whatsoever actually held the seeds of the redemption that was lacking and so that was Jung's commentary on the idea of the philosopher's stone because the alchemists who were, who were proto-scientists were trying to, pr trying to find a material substance that would be the philosopher's stone that would offer its holders wealth, health and eternal life and so you think, well, why are we pursuing science? Well, hopefully, because we think it'll do us some good here and now, right, in our bodies and so Jung regarded science itself as stemming from that compensatory dream it's a brilliant idea it's actually the only idea I've ever read that, that seems to do a reasonable psychological account for the emergence of science as a discipline it's a very strange practice you know, you have to you have to narrow your interests tremendously to be a scientist you have to focus on one set of phenomena you know, that might appear as useless to contemplate as how many angels could dance on the head of a pen you have to devote decades to the study of that thing to make incremental process or progress why in the world would people ever be motivated to do that? well, Jung's interpretation was well, there was a deep counter movement towards the over spiritualization of the psyche and that was the revaluation of matter and its possibilities. 